Welcome to the Porn Reboot Podcast, where you get practical tips to gaining control over your porn or sex addiction. We help ambitious men end their out-of-control sexual behavior with pornography, sex, and masturbation so that you can maximize your life, perform at your potential, and remain in control in the driver's seat, which is where you have to be in order to gain or maintain the success you want in life. I'm your host, J.K. Amazi, Certified Sex and Porn Addiction Recovery Coach. Welcome to the episode. This episode is going to take a slightly different route. We're going to move a little bit away from porn addiction and address a question from a brother in our group that has to do with, let's just say it has to do with inferiority and shame. His post says, I feel super inferior. And I feel shameful because my cousin invited me to a bachelor party of his cousin, whom I know. So I go to the place and once I enter the parking lot, I see nothing but brand new BMWs, Benzes, Audis, and other luxury cars, like 50 of them. While I'm driving my Honda Civic with a different colored door, I saw a bunch of macho men walking in and out. And these dudes have a lot of money, which I don't have at the moment. I didn't even walk in and I left with a friend of mine because I was filled with anxiety and inferiority. Now, the interesting thing is I feel this way the most with my own ethnicity. I feel that I don't live up to the standards of my culture. I only feel cowardice because I didn't walk in. So I don't know what this gentleman's background is, but I do know that there are many cultures out there that value machismo that value, I don't know if I pronounced that right, that value displays of wealth in men. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I know some guys listening to this might be like, oh yeah, that's not important. And some guys might feel it's important and relate to it. Either way, that's why I'm responding to it. You know, there was another gentleman who responded to this and his response was long, but I like what he ended with. He ended it with, My advice would be to really understand if you want those things or if you've accepted, you know, a specific idea he talked about. And I I really echo that to begin. First of all, I appreciate this brother's vulnerability. I think when it comes to out-of-control sexual behavior, a lot of men do not express some of the insecurities that might prompt them to engage in this behavior, some of the insecurities that they might be medicating with this behavior. I think spending some time reflecting on finding out if you want those things is very important. And I'd like to share, if it's helpful, a personal, just my personal journey with this briefly. I was in my 20s, and I'm assuming this brother is in his 20s because he's in the implementation program. I realized that it would be, you know, many years till I was able to get those nice things and project that nice image. I learned the hard way because. In my 20s, as many of you know, I was broke. I grew up in poverty. To add insult to injury, (laughs) I was horrible academically. I did not know I had a form of dyslexia either till recently, actually. So I took the only job that I could, which was a job selling books door to door. When I realized that I wasn't going to be able to project like wealth, like a nice car and all the things that I saw certain young men doing, I decided that I was going to focus on what I could control. And first of all, let's talk about why these things are important. Okay. There is something in in Western culture that I've noticed recently, and that is a tendency to downplay the importance of certain things for men. Let me make it clear. Whether you like it or not, society in general, the vast majority of society is going to judge you by your appearances because we are still human beings. A man is going to be judged by his resources. He's going to be judged by his strength. He's going to be judged by his appearance. All these things are important. And even if somebody has values that do not include how you look, that do not include the resources you have, maybe they're a spiritual or religious person, maybe they're a conservative person, whatever they are, they cannot escape the subconscious. These are facts. I know these are facts because I spent many years 
going door to door and speaking to thousands of people and having only a few seconds to make a first impression before strangers would let me into their home. And I did it long enough to not only survive in that environment, but to thrive. And I understood, and I came to understand actually, a lot about human behavior. So if you're sitting there thinking, ah, oh, all these things are not important, they don't really make a difference, what matters is how you feel on the inside, you're partially correct. But I hope you accept the fact that there is a price to pay if you do not focus on certain things like appearance and so on. But back to what I was sharing. When I realized that I did not have the financial resources to project a certain type of image, I realized that my only chance was maximizing my internal resources. So I include my physique as an internal resource, not something really external. I guess you could argue that it is external. But one of the first things I did was that I developed a good physique. One of the things I noticed when I went from being a six foot, 120 pound guy to a six foot, 200 pound guy with muscles was that I got treated differently. Nobody ever, this is, this sounds very simple, but then these are very primal things we're speaking about right now, which is why I say we're taking a different routes today. No guy ever acknowledged me. No man ever got out of my way. At least I didn't feel that way when I was 120 pounds. No man ever acknowledged me. But when I was 200 pounds of muscle, guys acknowledged me. And as simple as that sounds, for a man who was 21 years old, I felt more masculine. It felt good to be acknowledged by men. It felt good to be, even though, <laughs> you know, most guys think that when you put on muscle, the fantasy we have is like all the women are going to be, you know, drooling over our muscles and, and you know, talking to us and approaching us. The reality is that it's mostly guys in the gym who are admiring you and going like, hey, bro, like you look really fit, bro. Like great job with those pull-ups and so on. But I did develop a good physique and I realized that when I walked into a room as a younger man back then, I just was treated differently. And you only notice that, I believe, when you've not had that physique and suddenly you've transformed it. Next was that I worked on my social skills. This was when I made the choice to go into door-to-door -door sales and overcome my anxiety and learn how to be social and learn how to communicate. And so I worked on that. I learned how to highlight certain aspects of my personality. I learned what my shortcomings were. And I learned how to be absolutely unapologetic about them. I learned how to be myself and be happy being myself. I built up marketable skills. I learned how to fight. That makes a difference for men because I had a lot of fears about getting my ass kicked. So I, would, I noticed that this translated into my body language and into how I carried myself and into my eye contact with people and into my risk-taking behavior. Basically, I didn't take risks because I had a deep internal fear that I'd get my ass kicked. <laughs> I learned how to control my out-of-control sexual behavior. I believe these are some of the foundations of masculinity. Not all of them, of course. These are very basic things. There's a lot more to masculinity than that. But for the younger man, who is still trying to figure out what his values are, who is still trying to look for something that's going to make him stand out, I believe these are things that help. Now, while it didn't get me a nice car or a nice apartment, it did get me to stop thinking about my shitty Ford Taurus station wagon, which I was driving around. <laughs> I felt strong. I felt confident. And I felt competent. I mean, when you spent a few months when, you know, in the summer, everyone else goes off to, I don't know, vacations, they get regular summer jobs, but you went out there with a shitty Ford Taurus that overheated all the time. You had to carry like a gallon of water in the back seat so that every time it overheated, you'd pour water in it because <laughs> I couldn't even afford coolant. And when you sell stuff door to door, and you make enough to pay your tuition on your own. I would come back and I would drop six grand. I would drop eight grand. That's hard, backbreaking work in the sun. I felt accomplished. 
I felt, I was like, I'm not the smartest guy out there, but man, I, I worked my ass off. I worked 80, 90 hour weeks to do this. So I didn't give a shit that I drove a Ford Taurus. I felt proud of that vehicle. It had miles on it, but we had history together. You don't need to drive a BMW when you are competent in the things that you do. The cars, the nice things, those things eventually became optional for me because I built up other things in my life. Now, when I could afford those things eventually, I realized that I didn't even need those things. As many of you know, I've often spoken about my 2005 Toyota Camry, which has almost 300,000 <laughs> 300, miles on it. And I love that car because we have a lot of history together. When I walk into a place, let's say some superficial place, the rare times that I'm out in such places, I've never been judged by my Camry. I've never been judged by my Camry. And even if somebody did, I wouldn't know because the moment I open my mouth, they're going to forget what vehicle I was driving and judge me by that. And for this brother, I truly believe that you should focus on developing that. I think your personality, the energy you give out, the way you carry yourself, your character, things like your integrity should speak louder than the vehicle you drive. And I think if you focus on developing those things to the highest level possible in your life, finding your strengths and highlighting them, those things shine brighter than the nicest car that you could drive. Of course, if you can get yourself a decent vehicle that's clean, where the, the doors match, if you can afford that, if you can dress with clothes that fit you, if you look healthy and you don't look like a bum, all these things help. And then when you can afford it, you can decide whether you, you know, you want those things or not. But that still doesn't change the fact that shame can be a great motivator. And I have friends who didn't, they didn't go the route that I did, but they are my friends. They experienced shameful situations. We were all broke together and they compensated in their own ways. They decided to work harder in school. They got really focused on their career and they got promotions. They were very frugal with their money. They saved up, but they wanted these things. And eventually they became the guys with you know, the nice car, the nice house, the beautiful girlfriend who eventually became the trophy wife. You just want to be careful because you can get carried away with those things. I have acquaintances now. <laughs> who started trying to keep up with the Joneses. It became a habit. It went from being the single guy with the nice car to the beautiful girlfriend. The nice car became two nice cars, one for the beautiful girlfriend who is now a trophy wife. And then you've got to get the nice house. You got to move from the nice apartment into the nice house. And then you have kids and the kids have to go to the nice school. And before you know it, you look around and you're like, what the fuck happened? Is my life just about this? Is this, is, <laughs> is this all it's about? So, you know, if you choose to go that route, at some point, at the very least, pause and take a step inward to figure out exactly how you want your life to pan out. Again, a little bit of a different route. I rarely talk about these in the podcast, but I'd be curious to know if this resonated with anyone who's listening. As always, feel free to shoot me an email, jkemezi at elevatedrecovery.org, and just put the topic of the podcast. You can preface the subject of your email with podcast, and I'll know it's a response to a podcast episode. I'm JK, your brother in this struggle. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Porn Reboot Podcast. I'll speak to you later on in the week. If you found this episode helpful, here are four ways I can help you with your out-of-control sexual behavior for free. The first way is to grab a free copy of my book, Confessions of a Porn Addict, Seven Secrets of Porn-Free Men at elevatedrecovery.org or visit the link in the description below this episode. The second way is if you're not sure where to start, but you'd like to learn more about my team and I, 
If you'd like to spend time with like-minded professionals and business owners who are controlling their behavior, then join our free and confidential group, The Porn Reboot Group on Facebook. There's a link to join in the description below this episode. The third way is if you need help right now because you have a burning issue, your behavior with pornography is hurting you mentally or emotionally, you're about to lose your relationship, you want to live up to your potential, be an authentic man and free yourself from shame, guilt and underachieving, then click on the link in the description below this episode that says free coaching call. And the fourth way is to leave us a five-star review if you enjoy this podcast so that we can reach more men who are struggling in silence and bring back the lessons we learn from coaching them to freedom. 